morning. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here in Malaysia and to speak at the Asian Science Camp to a crowd of young scientists uh, who I hope are as excited about science as I still am and look forward to a life in science. There are many kinds of science. There are many wonderful questions that scientists explore from cosmology, astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology. I can tell you for myself, nothing is better than a life of a scientist. You spend your life, and you can earn a good living, doing what you enjoy, exploring nature. And there's nothing more exciting than to explore nature and to discover new facts, new understanding about the natural world. I'm going to briefly tell you something about the frontiers of science, the frontiers of physics is the field I work in as a theorist. I don't do experiments myself. I try to figure out how uh, to explain experimental observations and measurements and make sense out of the world to construct new theories and explanations and to test them with experiments and measurements. Uh, I've lived now worked in science for almost 50 years. And during that time, we have made enormous advances throughout all of science, especially in physics, where we have, to a large extent, discovered, measured, and understood many of the basic building blocks of matter and the forces that act on them. The field that does this is called elementary particle physics. Its goal is to explain, understand, observe what matter is made out of and how it is put together. And, as you all know, Matter, even this beautiful rose, is made out of point, what appear to be small point-like objects, atoms. All the material that is in this room are composites, molecules, atoms. But in the last 50 years, we've understood in exquisite, in great detail, and quantitative detail, the ability to understand quantitatively what atoms are made out of. The structure of the atom and of the components of the atom. We learned that atoms are made out of electrons, which revolve around a very small nucleus. Here it's much bigger than it seems it's really only one hundred thousandths of the size of the atom. The electrons revolve around the atom, uh, the nucleus, and the nucleus is made out of another elementary particle called a quark. The nucleus is made out of neutrons, and protons, and each neutron and proton is made of three quarks. So quarks and electrons are the basic building blocks of all matter. The quarks make up the nucleus, the electron and the nucleus make up the atom, atoms make up molecules, molecules make up ordinary matter, including you. More importantly, in the, this period, we not only identified the building blocks of matter, more importantly, we understood in great detail the beautiful theory, the 
forces, the nature of the forces that hold the quarks together inside the nucleus and are responsible for the structure of atoms and molecules. The force of electricity and magnetism, and within the nucleus, two nuclear forces. A strong nuclear force that holds quarks together in fact, so strongly that you can never remove them from the nucleus. And the weak nuclear force, which turns one kind of quark into another, is responsible for radioactivity, the transmutation of elements, nuclear reactions of various types. The theory of the quarks and electrons and their companions, neutrinos, other quarks, and the forces that act within the atom and the nucleus make up what we call the standard theory of elementary particles. Enormously successful, fundamental theory of just about all the matter that we have ever directly observed in nature. But it's not only at the very small atomic level that we have made enormous progress. We also, in the last 50 years, have mapped the entire universe and reconstructed its history. A hundred years ago, people were unaware of the existence of other galaxies and thought that all the universe was the Milky Way, the galaxy we live in. But now we have a complete, almost complete history of the universe from the beginning. We can even date that quite precisely to 1%, 13.7 billion years ago, in a very small region of space our universe expanded rapidly and we can now, in a quantitative fashion, describe the 13.7 billion year history. And finally, with the aid of quantum mechanics, and the understanding of the elementary particles and the force laws, we're beginning to achieve exquisite understanding and control of matter, ordinary matter, in all of its different phases and structures, down to now the nanometer scale of atoms. And I'd like to describe a bit the frontiers of our knowledge in physics, the questions we ask in these three areas of cosmology, astrophysics, the fundamental physics of uh, elementary particles, and condensed matter physics that tries to control and understand atoms and matter at the atomic level. So I'm not going to spend too much time on explaining the marvelous theory of physics that we have constructed. Uh, that's something you can learn in school, and I hope you do. It's beautiful, and powerful, and applicable to many areas of science. But I want to focus on what I call ignorance, because in some sense, the most important product of knowledge is ignorance. Knowledge, of course, is important to understand and satisfy one's curiosity. But science progresses on ignorance. And by ignorance, I don't mean the bad kind of ignorance that leads to bigotry and racism and bad behavior. I mean the new questions that are a product of knowledge. 
There's something you probably already experience in your life. The more you know, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. You have to be quite sophisticated. You have to be quite knowledgeable to be able to ask good new questions. As we have learned more and more about how the physical world works, we have many new questions that we are becoming aware of which are even more interesting, and that is what stimulates scientific progress. But what I mean by the reason you have to know so much in order to ask good questions is that good questions are questions that can be answered by the scientific method. It's easy to ask questions like, what is the world made of? But that's not a question that can immediately be answered by observation or experiment or theory. You need to know quite a bit to formulate good questions. And part of your training as scientists will be training about how to ask the right question. So let's discuss some of the questions, and let's start at the beginning, the origin of the universe. I showed you a picture of the history of the universe, and it begins when all of the universe that we observe was concentrated in a very small volume. Very hot, very dense, very energetic. We don't know how it got to started. I'll come back to that. At some point, it started expanding rapidly. It's called inflation, rapid expansion of the universe. All the points in the universe, this, in space, move away from each other rapidly. That expansion <laughs> led to a growth we believe in the volume of the universe by many billions and billions and trillions of times. And then it slowed down, entering a period of slow expansion. We have a picture of the universe 300,000 years after it began. How, how could we have such a picture? Well, it takes light a finite amount of time to reach us from far off distances. So when we look up into the sky and gather the light that's coming to us from stars and galaxies, it was discovered uh, 50 years ago that there's also light coming from far off places in the universe 13.4 billion years ago. This is what that picture looks like. That light has been redshifted by the expansion of the universe so that it appears as microwave radiation. And it looks totally white light at a certain temperature. It is what we call thermal radiation. It's the light that would be emitted by a body at around 3 degrees Kelvin. 3 degrees above absolute zero. Totally uninteresting. This is what the universe looked like. Just a uniform, homogeneous radiation, light, but also a gas here of quarks, electrons, and so on, but nothing interesting. Pretty boring universe. But people knew that that couldn't be the case, because if you start off with a boring universe, you'll end up with a boring universe. 
So there had to be structure. And after some 20 years, with instruments that could see more detail, this is what, this is the black body radiation of a, with no structure. But if you blow up by a factor of 100,000, you see some detail, some parts of the, this bath of radiation which is hot, that's the red spot, some which is a little colder, one part in a hundred thousand. That means that here there's sort of more matter, clumpier, and in the blue spots there's less. Now gravity attracts particles attracts matter. Everything, all matter is attracted to each other by gravity. So if you have a hot spot, a clump of matter here, it will attract itself and get more concentrated. The opposite will occur in the cold spots. And our understanding of physics and astrophysics and gravity is good enough so that you can start with this observation and run the universe forward to see what happens. And this is what comes out. Those clumps come together, coalesce. Oops. Form structure. These filaments are where the matter is now concentrated. They're concentrated along sheets and strings, and here there's so much matter that stars and galaxies begin to form. This description is, it allows astrophysicists to reconstruct the history of the universe so that from this rather homogeneous gas, three degrees, structure emerges, galaxies, planets, stars, the universe as we know it. And the universe continues to expand, and now we have observed that that expansion is again beginning to accelerate. Slow. It's a beautiful picture. And it's a very successful quantitative description of the complete history of the universe, except that we're not exactly sure, we're not at all sure how it began, and we're not sure how it will end. At the beginning, if we use the same theory of fundamental physics and gravity, our equations break down. And that's what's called sometimes the Big Bang. We don't know what that is. But if we really want to understand the nature of those small fluctuations that gave rise to galaxies and planets, we need to understand how it began. So astrophysicists, cosmologists, physicists are now beginning to ask a question that was never asked scientifically until now, which is, how did the universe begin? This has now become a scientific question. And we're not sure how far back we can probe, observe, indirectly or even directly, with gravitational waves, waves of space-time. We're also not sure whether physics is, can answer such a question, since it never had to do so before. Can we determine how the universe began, the initial condition? That's pretty strange question, because if the universe began, time began. What does that mean? What happened before the universe began? 
Or maybe it didn't begin. Maybe it expands and collapses. And some people try to construct cyclic universes. But by and large, we simply don't know the answer. This is one of the questions that motivates astronomy, motivates cosmology, motivates fundamental physics. And I am pretty convinced that in your life, maybe not mine, we will perhaps know the answer to this question. Most likely, we won't, aren't formulating the question correctly. But there will be a question, a right way of asking this question, how did the universe begin, of which we will begin to have quantitative answers. Astronomers have also taught us two other important lessons that challenge our understanding of elementary particles. And that is that most of matter in the universe is not made up of quarks and electrons, like we are, and like everything in this room is. It's made up of some other kind of matter called dark matter. And furthermore, there's a, another kind of energy in the universe that causes this expand, accelerated expansion. And both of these are deep mysteries that we can't explain with our standard theory of the elementary particles. Dark matter uh, is observed indirectly. If we look at our galaxy and measure the velocity of the stars that go around the galaxy, you can, using Newton and Einstein's theory of gravity, calculate how much mass, how much matter there is in the galaxy that makes the stars go around in their orbits. And it turns out there must be more matter in the galaxy than you can see with your eyes. More matter that is dark, doesn't radiate. Astronomers have by now convinced us that there's lots of this dark matter. Otherwise, you cannot explain the motion of stars or the motion of galaxies. One of the most beautiful pictures of astronomy is of a collision of two clusters of galaxies. What you see here is a collision that happened far off from us about a billion years ago. Two clusters of galaxies collide. And this picture is strong evidence that that cluster of galaxies consists of ordinary matter, that's this red stuff. The red is light coming from those galaxies. And this blue stuff, which we can't see, but we can reconstruct by the gravitational lensing of this matter. Light passing by the sun is deflected. Light coming from behind the dark matter, the blue dark matter here, is bent. And by measuring the bending of these galaxies behind the dark matter, you can map out the blue dark matter. So in this collision, what happened was these ordinary matter hits itself, interacts, there's friction, slows down, the dark matter just keeps going. 
And with these methods, you can map out the uh, distribution of dark matter in the universe and count how much there is. We've never seen dark matter on Earth, but from these clues, we know it must exist. One of the big challenges for physics is to observe directly the dark matter passing through us right now. If this is correct, Thought hundreds of dark matter particles are passing through your bodies every second. Now, luckily, they interact very weakly, if at all, so you don't feel them. They don't do any harm. But that's also why we can't see them and measure their properties. So, the big challenge and open question for particle physics astronomy, for cosmology, is to understand the properties of dark matter, to observe it directly, to produce it in the laboratory in a big accelerator. And that, too, that challenge, I am convinced, will be met and understood within the next decade, for sure. Dark energy, which causes the accelerated expansion of the universe, is another mystery. Although Einstein's essentially understood that phenomenon. In Einstein's theory of gravity, the vacuum, empty space, can possess some energy. And if it does, that energy will cause the universe to expand at an accelerated rate. And we believe that that's probably the explanation of the accelerated expansion that is observed in our universe. But we don't know for sure. If that's the case, by the way, the universe will ex ex have accelerated expansion forever, which is not such a pleasant future. What it would mean is that in about 20 billion years from now, your great-grandchildren go out in the night and look at the sky all of the other galaxies will have disappeared. They will be moving away from us so fast, faster than the speed of light, that we cannot see them again. And only the Milky Way will be left in our visible part of the universe. But we don't know that that's true or the end. And it is part of the question that is, I believe, as equally interesting as how did the universe begin, is how, did the, how will the universe end? The universe is not static. It's expanding. It's changing. Its end is unclear. There is isn't. This, that, what I told you was that the, this energy of the vacuum could cause the universe to accelerate its expansion. And the interesting thing is that we expect that the vacuum will be full of energy because of quantum mechanics. Classic, the classical vacuum Classical physics is nothing. It's empty. Your picture of the vacuum is probably something like this. Nothing is going on. You take everything out of this room, all the atoms, all the molecules, turn off 
all the electric and magnetic fields. There's simply nothing. But in quantum mechanics, there are always fluctuations. Fluctuation, you can't determine that there's nothing without doing an experiment to see what there is in the vacuum. And in doing so, you disturb it, so there's something and the vacuum, actually, in quantum mechanics, looks more like this. This is a picture we believe is accurate of fluctuating fields, the fields that hold quarks together in the nucleus at the scale of the proton. So the scale here is that this is 10 to the minus 13 centimeters across the size of a proton. And these are fluctuating chromodynamic fields that are responsible for holding the quarks together, for exerting the forces on the quarks. And in quantum mechanics, these fields are fluctuating. This is what a vacuum looks like. And in fact, it was this discovery that led us to the understanding of the strong nuclear force. Because it's the properties of this quantum medium, the vacuum, at the scale of quarks, that le led us to understand the strange force law between quarks. It led us to understand that quarks could be very weakly interacting at short distances. And when you pulled them apart, the force got stronger and stronger. Very unusual, but was the key to understanding the strong nuclear force, part of our standard model of the strong interactions. That's what was referred to by asymptotic freedom, Forces get weak, the quarks are close, strong when they're far apart. And that led to the theory of the nuclear force quantum chromodynamics. This is a picture, a calculation in quantum chromodynamics, what happens when you pull the quarks apart. And what is pictured here, these blue, these lines are the field lines the lines of force, like the line, like the line, the field lines of electric and magnetic field, which are being forced by the properties of this quantum vacuum to be squeezed into a tube. And as a consequence, you can never pull the quarks out of the proton and the neutron. That's why no one has ever seen a quark. These forces don't fall off with distance, and it requires an infinite amount of energy to ionize a proton. Well, that, in fact, was the discovery that led to uh, the Nobel Prize. I wanted to show you this because when the king gives you this his hand, he gives you a metal check and a painting by a Swedish artist. And here is the painting which shows the proton, three quarks which are bound together. This is what it actually looks like in the theory if you take the proton and try to pull three quarks out. And these flux lines are being squeezed by the vacuum into these tubes. And that's why it's truly impossible to remove the quarks from the proton. Now, with all of these fields fluctuating and moving around in the vacuum, it's not surprising that they give rise to a vacuum energy, which would cause an accelerated expansion of the universe. 
So in a sense, we can understand that amazing fact that the universe is expanding at an accelerated rate. But for theorists, we would like to calculate that rate of expansion. And the back of the envelope, the naive calculation would say that the cosmological energy density would be this order of magnitude. But the observation is 120 orders of magnitude smaller. This is a problem for theorists. And we don't understand why this number is so small. So that's a difficult question. We have no good ideas yet. But it's difficult challenges, difficult questions like this that motivate science forward. We have a partial understanding of the expansion of the universe. Everything is good, except we really would like to calculate and understand why the number is 10 to the minus 4 and not what you would have guessed, 10 to the 120. The other thing we really would like to understand in particle physics is the nature of these, of, of these three separate forces that act within the atom and the nucleus. We have the force of electricity and magnetism and the two nuclear forces. Now the amazing thing in this standard theory is that all of these forces that act within the atom are somewhat similar. And understood in the correct way, they seem to be, they are, the same kind of force. The strong nuclear forces are much stronger than electromagnetic forces in the nucleus, in the atom. But that can change as you look at these particles and these forces at shorter distances. Just like the strong force became strong when the quarks were far apart and weak when they were closer together. And if you take the equation of the standard theory of particle physics and extrapolate to even shorter distances where we can't yet measure it directly, it turns out that the forces come together as if they were all unified into one force if you look at very short distances or very high energy. So for many years now, we have been trying to understand how the forces of nature unify. And one of the most important clues is that gravity becomes equally important at those energies. Gravity is very important. We all feel gravity all the time. But in the atom, in the nucleus, at ordinary distances, it's a very weak force. We only feel it because the planet has 10 to the 54 atoms. It's a big object. And the force of gravity acts on everybody, and you can't screen it. <coughs> so I like to argue, show you that gravity is so weak by holding this up. And I am exerting a little bit of force, electromagnetic force, coming from the chemical processes in my muscles. That's all electromagnetism, atoms and molecules. And the whole Earth, every atom of the 
trillion, 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 10 to the 54 atoms in the Earth is pulling this down. And I could easily hold it up with a little bit of electricity and magnetism. But gravity, the force of gravity, uh, increases like energy. Like the charge of gravity is mass or energy. And at these energies, or very short distances, it becomes equally strong, equally important. And that suggests that we need to unify all the forces of nature, including gravity. And that is one of the things we've been working on for the last 30 years. And we have an approach originally based on the idea that elementary particles are not particles but strings to approach them. And we also have experimental tools like the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, experiments that collide protons and measure the province of the collision with enormous, unbelievably uh, elaborate detectors. And we try to explore higher energy, shorter distances where the forces come together. And theorists try to understand, can we describe all of the particles and forces in a unified way as different vibrating strings? We don't know the answer to We don't know the answer to that question, but the search to the answer has raised some fundamental questions about space and time that I'd like to briefly describe to you. For example, in string theory, this approach that particles are extended object strings, it turns out we need more than three spatial dimensions left, forward, up. And that's possible. It's possible, for example, as in certain ways of looking at string theory, that there are extra dimensions. Here is a picture of six extra dimensions that are curled up. And the remarkable thing about this approach is that it can answer some of the questions that the standard theory cannot. Like, why are the forces what they are? Strong, weak, electromagnetic. What kinds of matter exist, what masses they have? All of these questions unanswered by the standard theory are determined by the shape of the hidden dimension. In string theory, or in any attempt to incorporate gravity, we have to deal with the fact that gravity is the dynamics of space and time. That was Einstein's great discovery, that energy and mass 
curved to the space time. And that is what gravity is. But if we look at space time, we look at phenomena at very short distances, it appears that the fluctuations, the quantum fluctuations of space time itself become uncontrollable. Now, there are many strange features of dynamical space time, of curved space, of gravity, at the classical and the quantum level. One of the strangest is the existence of black holes. If you have enough matter in a small region of space, it can exert such a strong gravitational force that light cannot escape. And that's what we call a black hole. Black holes were discovered theoretically shortly after Einstein's theory, but nobody was sure that they exist. Now we know the universe is full of them. Every galaxy has a black hole at its center. And we have even this year, last year, observed the collision of two massive black holes somewhere in the universe one and a half billion years ago. These were observed in a gravitational wave observatory, which consists of an interferometer, the LIGO experiment, where light uh, goes back and forth along these two <coughs> legs of the interferometer. And it is sensitive enough that a gravitational wave, a wave of space, compressed expanded space and passing through this detector and making, changing the length of one of the arms by a fraction of the size of a proton can be measured. And when they started running the advanced LIGO last year, they discovered a event, a oscillation in the length of these interferometer legs. There are two of them. There is another interferometer a thousand kilometers away in Washington state. One of the blue and the red are different observations with great agreement. And this precisely fits the prediction of Einstein's theory of gravity. If you imagine that there are two black holes that collide, produce an enormous amount of energy, converting their mass, 20% of their mass, to energy, energy in the form of a wave of gravity, gravity wave, a ripple in, the, in space itself that then traveled throughout the universe for 13 and a half billion years before we could measure it. And the two come together and form a bigger black hole. These black holes are roughly 50 times the mass of the sun. An amazing event, an amazing observation, and one that will open astronomy up to measuring and observing the properties of black holes throughout the universe. Black holes are also useful for theorists. They present many paradoxes, and we have been exploring their properties 
using string theory and beginning to solve some of these paradoxes. The theoretical advances in understanding the properties of black holes and of quantum gravity have led us, however, to suspect that space-time itself is a emergent concept. Space and time are our most fundamental concepts of, the, of physical reality. But they are just models that we construct as infants to understand our sensory perception to understand the world. You don't see directly or feel space or time. It's a mental construct. We're beginning to think that it's not the best way of thinking about physics. There's something better. And that space-time is a crude, pretty good for most purposes but not necessarily when you are interested in the properties of black holes or the origin of the universe, or perhaps the structure of matter at very short distances. I'm going to end by briefly asking a different question. You might ask, this is nice, try to understand all the matter and the forces, and to unify them, and space and time and the origin of the universe, but what's it good for? Well, it's good because it's nice to understand these deep questions. We all would like to know how did the universe begin, but it's more than that. There's a wonderful story about Queen Victoria visiting Faraday's laboratory, and he had all of these wonderful magnets and stuff in the laboratory, and she was very impressed, and she said, uh, oh, what is it good for? And Faraday, who had, was exploring electricity and magnetism, didn't know the answer. He didn't say it's good for the Industrial Revolution, because he didn't know that it would be good for the Industrial Revolution. He said, I don't know. <coughs> But when we find out, you will tax it. So what is all this exploration in fundamental physics good for? Well, we have a great example of what it is good for, and that is quantum mechanics. I mean, I too don't know what it's good for. But quantum mechanics, which was discovered a hundred years ago, almost, not even a hundred years ago, has totally revolutionized our world and dominates technology. Without quantum mechanics, we wouldn't have the transistor, that's the first transistor, we wouldn't have a laser, we wouldn't have integrated circuits, we wouldn't have modern computers, we wouldn't have the iPhone. None of that would have been possible without the deep understanding and the discovery of how the atom works, which is based on quantum mechanics. And that revolution, which allows us to understand and control down to the atomic level, continues till today. And there is one area we know what it's good for. It's good for, at the atomic level, putting at, constructing new materials atom by atom. And with amazing properties. <clears throat> there are two ways of constructing new materials both of which nowadays are being totally revolutionized by our theoretical understanding of quantum mechanics and of atomic structure. One is 
more traditional way of constructing new combinations of atoms, molecules, chemistry, but now with the help of lasers and theoretical quantum mechanics, one can control basic chemical reactions at the atomic level. And the other way is to, use, to construct new materials, atom by atom, or layer by layer, new materials which have, can have enormous numbers of new applications. What is our understanding of the nuclear force and the structure of nuclei good for? Well, here I don't know, but it would be silly to say they'll never be as important a use either. So let me, I'm out of time completely. Oh, yes. These new materials that we are trying to construct might be used to keep Moore's Law going, to construct quantum computers. And one of the big efforts in using quantum mechanics to control atoms in order to construct new materials is to construct new materials that allow one to do computation by using quantum mechanics, which turns out to be much more efficient than ordinary computers. Ordinary computers work with bits. Quantum computers work with quantum bits. And they are much more powerful, in some cases exponentially more powerful than classical computers. But we need the understanding of quantum mechanics itself and atomic physics to construct the quantum computers that will allow us to do the calculations that will enable us to construct new kinds of materials, and so it goes. The new knowledge produces new technology, which produces new tools, which creates new knowledge. Knowledge and control go hand in hand. So, prospects in this direction for the discovery of new matter and the creation of new forms of old matter uh, is very, very exciting. I'm uh, going to skip to the end, because I'm way over time, and simply say that many people have argued this is the 20th century was the century of physics. This is the century of biology. To some extent, that's true. Biology is a young science, and there's much to be discovered and understood. But in my opinion, there's no question that physics, the queen of science, will continue to be important and in fact, continue to be all important for the development of the tools, both experimental and observational, and conceptual for all the other sciences, including biology. So I end with that, and the best is yet to 